as a coach for you and for me is that we always, you know, aspire people to set goals because once you've got a goal, you've got the motivation to get somewhere because without a goal, it's really hard to keep going. Yeah, I always say that once you pay for an event, whether it be New York Marathon or a big Ironman or any other marathon, you've always got, already got your value because you've already got the, the impetus, the motivation to do the training, to get off your backside and go out and brave the elements or get up early in the morning and juggle of life. So before you've even paid, even if you don't even make it to the event, you've already got your money's worth because it creates such pulling power. Without it, we'll just we'll have the best, best intentions. We'll always end up back on the couch, living the normal life, unfortunately. So yeah, signing up to an event is definitely the first step and it's the most important part of the journey, definitely. Hi, I'm Anna Liptak and I've been a fitness trainer now for over 15 years. Over this time, I've been privy to witness so many ordinary people achieve so many wonderful things. Through this podcast and the documentary I co-produced, I'm Not A Runner, I want to share these stories to show everyone that anything is possible if you have the belief and the motivation. I'm really excited because today I have Nigel Peach with me today and Nigel has been with me for my running journey and has given me much of my knowledge and advice that I've acquired over the years and that's what I really advise people is that they surround themselves with really good people that can help them to further themselves. So thank you, Nigel, for being there for me for many years now. No, it's fun. I live my life through my <laughs> athletes. So uh, whenever they achieve, you achieve and you get to go to Beijing Marathon Wall Climb, you go to New York, you do all that stuff through you. So it's always a fun part when you're working with someone. Yeah, and, and now you're also with me, assisting me with my online programs and advising me in that as well. So I really appreciate that and the information that you can give into that because the more people that can contribute into that program, the more that the my clients are, are getting. So thank you for contributing to that. But I really want to start off today to say, who are you, Nigel? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Grew up on the farm and all the rest side of things, but my background is as a sports scientist and now I'm more involved in endurance sport coaching, particularly triathlon, but definitely a lot of swim, bike and runners um, on their own in there. I've been yeah, working for myself for probably 20 odd years now, but like most Adelaide boys, I guess who grew up playing footy and all the rest, but uh, eventually you learn that the footy world's a little different to the to some of your goals and dreams that you want to achieve it's a lot more individual um, which is what attracted me to to running and triathlons and all those sort of things so when you uh, set your own personal goals and chase them so yeah I've been doing that for 20 or 30 years with my clients my kids are involved with it now um, it's a lot of fun watching them and all the athletes that you work with yeah, along their journeys like yourself and everyone else. It's been a, yeah, it's a fun ride. And of course, you've achieved some of your own um, spectacular goals. I was once again reading your uh, marathon time of 2.37, is it? Uh, is it was 2.38. 2.38, which is a pretty good time, on Nigel. Yeah, probably, yeah, I was a, just a, probably a kid when I did that as well. So I didn't probably get a give myself a chance to shine coaches weren't really a thing when I was growing up and you didn't really have that environment to get involved with so I would have liked to have thought I could go a lot quicker but yeah I still hang my hat on that was a pretty well, good run I I'd couldn't have hanging. done much better but uh, so when was that what year was that well that was like 2000 2001 I don't know something like that yeah right like at that. the start so, you know that's fantastic and what about Ironman because that's something that I really aspire to and hope that you'll get me to one day but the time's got to be right for me because I know it's a lot of time that's involved in training for an Ironman yeah, there's a little step up uh yes yeah, so I got to my goal was always to get to Hawaii and do Kona so that I uh, must be 99 I did the marathon because I think Kona was 2000 and yeah, I did Ironmans and triathlons for many years but then life comes along with kids and family and all those sort of things and work and and the like so and injuries unfortunately i've achieved most of my goals but you never stop wanting to move forward never stop wanting to achieve just turn a new page over and start again and yeah, uh, and forget I guess, about the past and i guess that's one of the thing as a coach for you and for me is that we always you know at, aspire people to set goals because once you've got a goal you've got the motivation to get somewhere because without a goal it's really hard to keep going yeah, I always say that once you uh, once you pay for an event, whether it be New York Marathon or a big Ironman or any other marathon, you've always got already got your value because you've already got the 
the impetus, the motivation to do the training, to get off your backside and go out and brave the elements or get up early in the morning and juggle of life. So before you've even paid, even if you don't even make it to the event, you've already got your money's worth because it creates such pulling power. Without it, we'll just we'll have the best, best intentions. We'll always end up back on the couch, living the normal life, unfortunately. So yeah, signing up to an event is definitely the first step and it's most important part of the journey definitely. Yeah it's interesting because in 2018 I took a team of 60 people that I trained and all of them got to New York because it was New York. They paid, they did everything they could, they could, they got physios, they got all sorts of people to help them to that starting line. Whereas if I've taken a group to say let's just say a local marathon, I would say probably 50-40% might make it to the starting line. So there's that Once you, like you say, you pay and you're going somewhere that you really want to go to, there's that big impetus too. So, Yeah, um, particularly there's sort of different types of motivation. You've got your internal and your external motivators. Signing up for an event, that's like external motivations. And for beginners, that's a big part of it. They need a good support network around them, a good lot of friends and family and people to train with and support coaches and all the rest. And you need those little event goals. Once you get more uh, conditioned in your running journey then it becomes more about the internal satisfaction for some it's chasing times and performances for others it's just the fulfillment they get when they cross the finish line or start the journey or the little challenges they set themselves little improvements they get so yeah it's initially it's you like to think you need the external motivators but eventually it becomes a routine and a habit doesn't it yeah and it's driven internally it's driven by because it meets your values and it's what you want in life so yeah um, without it life's yeah, just mundane for a lot of people. So running gives it that little bit of importance or, you know. Re- and something for yourself, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, something for yourself. It's yeah. your values that are important for you. We'll, we'll run for various reasons. Some are for competition and some are for uh, fitness and some are for social and all the rest. And it's just the, the running and the triathlons just become the vehicle that allow you to achieve what you want, into lo- want in life, which you can't normally get in day-to-day work and life and and all the rest so these big events yeah give us fulfillment on what's in you know the things that are important for us and they certainly change all different components in our life as well so you know you think you're signing up for a run but all of a sudden you're thinking about your sleep your social habits and all of a sudden that becomes a little bit different and you start feeling better about yourself so that's what then takes over because obviously you know I work with a lot of beginners people that haven't exercised before and they're really scared to start because you know people start bouting around times and um, the first thing I say is don't worry about the time get out and do it and you know that's I think one of the things that I, I think you've taught me as well is patience you know you just can't get out and just run if you haven't crawled yet so you know you you, you might have missed so some of the people that I train and obviously you train too you might have missed 20 years of their life and 20 years ago they might have been quite fast and remember that they were 800 meter runner and then they come out and all, all of a sudden they're injured so you know it's back to you know starting out where they're just walking and, and running you know so I think I think you know if we can sort of go into that sort of stage of running of, of people just starting out what would your biggest advice to someone starting to run who wanted to run a marathon let's say they see it as this big thing what would you say to them so along those same lines most of the people who you start working with you try to guide them that you're in reception like you're you're not a 40 year old a 50 year old a 60 year old you're in reception now and that's where you're at and then we'll get to year you know might get to high school in a few years time whatever with our evolution of how things evolve But you also want to build foundations. So you want to build the foundations of not how much training you do, but about learning how it fits in with your world, how to listen to your body, how to make smart choices, how to go out socially and not overindulge uh, like we all once upon a time probably did before running came along and then we were able to pull the reins in a little bit. But it is a matter of just building foundations and trying to get an understanding of training and what it means to us and how it fits in with our life and then how we can use things like our various tools that we have with the heart rates and paces and gps's to work for us and then find ways to stay you know being being injury free is a big part of it so how do we condition our body to make sure that we are able to make sure that we can graduate to year one and year two and year three is an important part of it definitely life balance probably the number one thing like for a beginner it's what you do has to add value to your world it can't take from it so it's got to add to how you view your existence but also your family and friends and social networks and all that has to add value to that side of things definitely you need to 
build a robust body, so you need to make sure your body's strong enough to be able to take the loads that eventually come at it, which means, yep, we do a lot of walking and walk, walk jogging. We expose our body to different training stimulus regularly. Definitely some strength work, definitely work with physios, particularly if you're prone to injuries, then you definitely want to talk to physios and work through that. You also, you know, if you're over 40, you probably need to chat with a doctor and get through, do the full blood uh, blood tests and look at family histories and look at things that might put you at risk, um, just to make sure that we're clear on where we're starting from. If there's anything that we might identify in any of that, we might look at dietitians as well, just to make sure we're, we're following the right pathway. So it's getting the holistic approach to it it really isn't about the training. You know, it's no magic formula with training. We just have to keep you enthused, keep you excited, keep you on the park, gradually overload you. And before you know it, you're crossing the finish line. So, but patience. Sounds simple, sounds yeah, simple. Yeah, it is, <laughs> but yeah, that foundation phase, it's normally like it's quite a bit of time to just get your life in order. Like when I set a program for someone for the first month, I actually probably don't even expect them to do it almost. And the history would say they don't typically because they're just grappling with life and how's this going to fit in and where does it fit in? As long as they come back at the end of the month and they go, yep, I think I've got my head around it and I know how I'm going to fit this in. I've worked it out with the family. I've worked it out with work. That's really what you're looking for. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of hits and misses along the way. And it's just making sure you learn from every little hiccup that happens along the way and don't just get too caught up in chasing numbers and trying to be awesome straight away. It's uh, you only have to be ready on one day, and that's what we're building towards. And the and again, probably the other end game advice is that the marathon is your celebration. Like that's where you find out if what's worked, what hasn't, but also how far you've come. And along that journey, people are really good at looking forward to where they want to be, particularly if they train with others. And they're always trying to trying to emulate what other people are doing ahead of them. And they think, yeah, I'm doing all this, but they're up here, they're up there, and they want to get there. So the best advice is just never forget to look backwards and yes, look behind and you and, yourself. and just see how far you've come. And that's why if you keep little logs, keep little journals, any little records you can see, you can look back and go, wow, I really have uh, progressed a long way. Sure, others may be way ahead of me, but this is where I'm at and we all have to be comfortable with who we are and our own evolutions and, and just be patient in our, our journey towards it. And yeah, never lose sight of why you started in the first time. We've all got a reason. Everyone's got a story, a backstory. That's the reason there. So keep that foremost and then, yeah, always come back to that. That's whenever someone's in a tough time or whatever, you just say, well, why are we doing this in the first place? And often they find that what how they're operating isn't congruent with what they wanted their goals to be in the first place so yeah once we can get those two lining up then we're back on track yeah and i think you know we're always comparing ourselves you know wherever we get to you know when i was probably at my best i'm still comparing myself to people above me but now that i'm nowhere near where i was i wish i'd appreciated it more when I was there. So I think you're right, you know, we have to appreciate where we've come from, what we're doing, and just enjoy each step as we go along like that. You know, even if it's this month, I've been able to get out to my 12 sessions rather than the 11 sessions. I mean, that's a celebration in itself. Or this week I managed to get a babysitter. Just trying to manage your life. And I think that's a, a really big one because if you can get out to the training sessions and tick them off, which I think is a really important part for me. You know, I remember ticking mine off for Boston and it was a plan that you'd written me, Nigel. And I only had 11 sessions left, but I knew that in my head I could get through those 11 sessions. And it was just a matter of ticking them off and that made me feel so, so good. But then when I lined up at that starting line, I knew that I'd given everything I could and there was nothing left for me. I guess it's that preparation and just being comfortable with that was you had the plan of attack that you had to follow and the same with your clients. They've got this plan. They're just going to have faith in the plan that it all come together for them. Everyone's always going to respond differently, though. Some will if we give the same program to 100 people. Majority will move forward, but there will some that will move forward at a faster rate and some that won't progress as quickly. So you just have to accept who you are as a person and just yeah never lose sight of why you started in the first place and just enjoy the enjoy the journey yes um, and have little celebrations along the way um, give yourself a little high fives occasionally is always worthwhile and celebrate with the group you know we've we've got a group in the, a facebook page you know let them know you know other people want to celebrate for people and i think one 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 key thing that you just said then is that yes we're doing this online program but people are going to progress at different stages 
stages and that's okay. So if you see someone that started out with you, you don't know really what their background was to begin with. You don't know their injuries. So you might've had an injury and it's okay to go back and redo something and feel okay about that because it's not like yours, which is personal coaching. So online coaching is very different and it's okay to miss a session. Like you always say to me, if you're tired, just pull it up because you're prone to injury. If you're if you're not feeling good or you're sore, don't do the run. You'll do more damage to yourself. So I think that sort of advice is what people need to hear again and again because when you're in a plan and say, I, you, you know, you've set me 20Ks, I feel like, oh, my God, I, I won't succeed. It's all over if I don't do this 20Ks today. But if I've got a sore calf and I come back and I, I blow up my calf, then I'm set my back yeah. self back four weeks. Yeah, you definitely need your rules of engagement. These are things that Nigel would say. If you, if I'm not there, these are the things that people would go, oh, what would Nigel say if I was in this situation? It's always, you know, listen to your body, make smart calls, don't push a bad position. Um, even when you're feeling really good, it's better to, to quit while you're ahead. Sometimes, I always say your fitness improves quicker than what your body can actually cope with it. So we've got to get the tendons and the muscles and the ligaments to be strong enough to be able to take the loads. But because fitness can actually improve quite quickly in some people, they're running a lot faster than their body can cope with, so they get injured. So sometimes you just have to quit while you're... Um, if you feel good, you have to slow down just as much as you have to quit while you're ahead sometimes. And coming back from injury, that's a big time for that quitting while you're ahead. So you're always having to think, oh, it's probably enough now. So sometimes, yes, we have a plan to follow, but you have to be able to make smart calls in your self-management when you're there. And you have to develop your little rules of engagement that it's okay to skip a session if I'm tired, if I'm run down, if my numbers are not lining up. I know personally, if I don't have a good night's sleep, I might as well write the next morning off, but the evening I can normally function reasonably well for that one. So the little rules that you have to learn to get you through is, is definitely an important part of the, the journey. Yeah, because you know, there's, you know, I find with my training and training people, there's people who've got different mindsets. So there's some people who can overcome pain, go into hurting themselves, but there's some people who are only um, having a slight pain, but stop as well. So, you know, it's actually understanding yourself and where you're at, isn't it? Because... And the biggest problem with that is just guilt. Guilt's <laughs> yeah. the biggest problem people have is that they feel guilty if they miss sessions. Yes. So, and it's just dealing with that internal conflict that we have between I have to versus uh, what's best for my body. And I normally say the only, only have to's in training is recovery. All the rest is is just what you're managing for you as a person. Yes. So the recovery is the most important thing, but yeah, listening to your body, making smart calls. Over time, you learn how to deal with the guilt and you learn that if you're patient, things evolve and it gradually we get there. If I've been injured, I know if I haven't run for ages, I know it's 12 weeks to get myself to the point where eh, I can feel my fitness is starting to happen, but I've got to do be very patient in that first 12 weeks, otherwise I'll be broken again. And it's just learning to listen to your body as it gradually progresses through. But yeah, guilt's probably the biggest thing that most people are up against. So you're saying 12 weeks after coming back from an injury to just, to just get your body... Yeah, um, and, I always and, call it sort of a glandular fever phase where you, some days are good, some days are bad, you're up and down, you can't really see progress happening. Yeah. This is particularly for people who have been running a long time yes. and then they're coming back. Yeah. For newbies, everyone's going to respond differently. But newbies will probably improve from the get-go. They'll see gains. But the rest, it'll be hovering around and then suddenly it'll, it'll just click and you'll just go, wow, I'm doing nothing different and my fitness has just improved dramatically. So these are just little things that I learned um, over my experience of 20 or 30 years of doing it. So for uh, for you as an athlete, you, you need to, there's toolkits out there that'll give you this sort of information, but you really need to learn your own and develop your own little toolkit. Otherwise, you can't rely on yourself to make sound decisions. Um, you're always moment. gonna Yeah, you're always going to do the wrong one. So if you've got little templates for, oh, what should I do? Or what would Nigel say? Or what would Anna say? It goes, oh, yeah, she's probably right. I probably should take this one off and just live to fight another day. Yeah. That's the way we try to get people to uh, operate, whether it works all the time. We're all guilty of pushing yeah, when we right. shouldn't and doing And then things. we make the mistake and then we learn and then we're injured and then we're back to step one. So we have to learn. And I think that's part of life is, and for kids, you know, making mistakes is actually part of life. It's not a bad thing. It's learning. And, and, and every time you can learn something learn something from it don't think oh it's all over I'm, I'm a mess I'm injured think of what you can do rather than what you can't do and what you did that you next time don't have to do yeah, there's always something we can influence something we can we can focus on if we're out with injury we can work on other things or whatever so the science is pretty clear that if you've had some 
trauma in your program or in your upbringing or the rest, you actually perform better on race day because you're better able to deal with things that go pear shaped. You're better able to deal with life as it throws its curveballs at you on race day, whether that be the bus is late to get there or the weather's terrible or your shoes, something issues with it or blisters or whatever. You're able to deal with those things a lot better if you've had a program that hasn't gone to plan and things went pear shaped. Whereas those that had things go perfectly all along, they first sign of things going wrong and it's all over. Is, yeah, it's all over. Yeah. A lot of endurance sport is about um, expectations versus reality. And when our expectations match reality, we're all going hunky dory, million miles an hour, feeling great. As soon as expectations and reality don't line up, things will fall apart very quickly. So whether it be your expectations of how you think your fitness should evolve or your expectations about how the race day should evolve, you need to be learning continually your uh, understanding of how your body operates and how training should evolve to be able to make sure that the expectations match reality is really it's a bit like your kids you know yes you expect your kids to have run perfectly keep the house order keep the room tidy oh, do the dishes and all the rest <laughs> but the reality yeah, is. is a little different <laughs> so if we can get those two to line up we'll yeah. be happier but our expectations are up here and reality is down here so and i think that's really part of running nigel that i wanted to speak to you about the expectations okay so people will say to me look i can run 10ks in 50 minutes so that means essentially four times that I'm going to be running a marathon in whatever that is. I'm not very good at maths, but you know, they just times it by four and then they're like, well, so I'm going to run it like that. And I say, no, you're not. It doesn't work like that. So, and that's a really hard thing about running is, you know, someone runs two kilometers, say, let's say 12 minutes. And then they think they're just going to keep adding like that. And it doesn't happen. And you've really taught me that over all these years that eventually I got to the point where I was running marathons. And I found them easier than running my half marathons because the expectation was is that I could run the half marathons at a faster speed, which hurt a lot more because obviously my heart rate's higher. For me, eventually marathons were easier because I could run at a slower pace. But I think that whole pacing thing's a really big learning curve for people when they first come in. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, it is a big one. So obviously, yeah, you, you can't run your 5K speed as quick as your 3K or your 10K as quick as your 5K and all the rest. Fatigue's a, it's multifaceted as far as what causes fatigue. There's definitely physiological things like as we run faster, acid levels rise up, we get uh, changes in metabolites and various things, which is still the science is a little up in the air about it. But basically, the body will interpret what's happening. And if it says that this is beyond my capacity for what we can operate with, it'll slow down. There's a part of it as well, which says that the brain is managing your body and it's trying to avoid catastrophe. So it doesn't want you to blow up. It wants to keep you going. It doesn't want, it wants to protect itself foremost. So if we go out too hard, the brain is going, well, we're, we're meant to be doing a 10K here, but we're going out at 5K pace. There's no way we're going to be able to sustain this. So it'll put a handbrake on us and we'll eventually slow down. There will be indicators that will measure. So acid levels will rise up and various things like that. That'll help to slow it down. So the fatigue you're getting on race day will be a part of it will be the body is breaking down. You know, muscle fibers break down. Part of it will be that you're running out of fuel or that you've run out of fuel. Part of it might be overheating. So core temperature rises up. Part of it may be um, the brain to muscle connection may not be operating as smoothly as it could. There's all these different things that can happen there that could be a part of it. And the other part of it is that your brain is trying to protect itself. So a lot of training is about experience and it's about exposing you to different environments that allow you to program your brain. I always talk about raising your thermostat for what's acceptable or not. You can go for a long run one week and blow up totally. And the next week you do exactly the same run and you can cope with it fine. I'm not sure if you're magically that much fitter from one week to the next, but a big part of it for me is potentially it's just the brain saying, yep, you're good to go. Okay. You're fine. We did this last week. We can go the distance. So it's, it resets the thermostat for what's capable. It's a bit like if you're running a race and you blow up. I've had this before. I've blown up. But then I got towards the finish line. I was able to you know, sprint home to the finish line because, again, you can see the finish line. Your brain knows it can get to that point. Yep. So another way of looking at it is this rating of perceived exertion. So... When we run early on in a marathon, it should feel pretty comfortable. 
towards the end, if you're running a good marathon, you pretty much even split it, or you might even negative split the faster runners do still negative. Ones, yeah. So, so we get quicker over the back end, but that RPE starts off very comfortable, but by the end, we're running exactly the same speed, but it's, it's getting harder and harder and harder to maintain the same speed. Problem is with most people is that they start off too fast to start with. It feels great and awesome, but they're going at it 10K pace for a 42K run, which means that very soon into that, that RPE will go from a, oh, this is comfortable to this is getting moderate, this is getting harder. And once they're there, they've got nowhere to go. So they're already at hard early so in the race. So they have to slow down. So they're, yeah, they'll, put, they'll slow down, whether it be the metabolites changes or it's the brain putting the handbrake on. It doesn't really matter. You, you're going to slow down. So that's why when you come to marathon day, you really need to break it up thinking about that how exponentially the effort level is going to rise for the same speed. So if you break it up into quarters and you break the first quarter, it's like, I have to feel like I'm going slow. It has to feel like this is too slow. If you're not feeling like you're holding back, you're going too fast. The next phase is where you're settling in. If you've got heart rates or paces or things you're looking at, they would just settle in and it's pretty comfortable. Like you should get to the 21K mark going, this feels pretty good. I'm yeah. feeling comfortable with this. 21 to the you know the next 10 11 k's is like okay i'm in the race but somewhere along that you'll go oh yeah it's i'm actually having to work a little bit now to maintain the same speed everything's feel fine i'm not fatiguing and not breaking down and then the final quarter is where at some point in it it's like you'll get close enough to the finish line to go mentally i can get there now and that's when you really have to push and you're basically laying everything on the line and you, you try and you go as hard as you possibly can. Whether you increase your speed or not, who knows, but hopefully you've got capacity left to keep building so up. So wasted it all here. I remember I ran a city to bay once and I thought, I'm just going to go out because I'm feeling really good. And I must have raced out, you know, got to 6K and just went boom, you know, and then it was a really hard 6Ks. But I remember the best race and the best race was the one that you coached me for, for the Boston Marathon. And you said, we're gonna, you're going to try and negative split this. And, and I watched my heart rate, which you sort of said to me, just stay in between here and here. And I got to the 32K mark. And just as you said, you know you can make the next 10Ks, just go. And I negative split. And it felt fantastic because everyone else in the whole race was actually running backwards. And yeah. I, I reckon I overtook 10,000 people. So mentally, it was fantastic and too. That's the, yeah, that's a big part of it is that you can chase people down and you thrive on that. We're all competitors. Yeah, yeah. So, and it feels so good, doesn't it? Because you know everyone else feels so bad. No, <laughs> that is terrible. right. And you love it when you can run, run past people going, come on, you're looking good. Come on, keep going. And they do it to you and your fault. Yeah, and it's awful the other way. Strangle them. But yeah. we've all done those mistakes. I did a race once before GPSs and that. And it was the first, I had a plan I was going to run at say 3.30 or something for this half marathon. And I got to the first kilometre marker, which I thought, and I was 3.35 and I oh, God, I've got to speed up anymore. But the reality was it was 21.1 Ks. It was 1.1 Ks to the first marker. So I'd done ridiculously 310 or something oh, no. and I've tried to speed up and and you end up in a very bad place. So if you make a mistake early by going too fast, you'll pay for it massively over the back end. So I always say for every one second too fast early, probably going to cost you three seconds down the road. Whereas if you go out too slow, it may cost you a little bit, but it really won't cost you much because you'll be able to pick it up most of it at the back end. So yeah, getting your pacing right is critical. And I critical. think that's really interesting that you just said that then, you know, one second here or there, because when you're beginning, you actually think that, you know, six minute pace or 6.30 pace or seven minute pace is almost the same. And, you know, I've learned over the years that even five to 10 seconds makes a huge difference to me, you know, like yeah, from comfortable to not comfortable. It's only, and I remember one race, you know, when I was running all those marathons, you know, I could run a 3.30 marathon and that was hard, but I could run 338 and laugh and talk the whole way. Yeah. Eight minutes over a marathon. Crazy, I mean, isn't it? yeah. They're like a half marathon and a marathon. It's like 10, 15 seconds difference per kilometre. It, it's not much at all between the two. But at, if you're going at your half marathon pace or 10 seconds too quick for your marathon pace, when you get to halfway, that's it. You're done. <laughs> that's all there is. So you can't just suddenly go, oh, I'll have this have this gel and it'll save me you know there's no coming back from it the brain is put the handbrake on to save you going to catastrophe um, it's probably the easiest way of thinking about that uh, fatigue phenomenon that you'll experience so do you think that people should do that for every run like whether it be a 2k a 5k 10k always go out slower and come back harder like yeah, do that negative split? you definitely want to do it deliberately in training do some runs where you might do a you know a 9k and every 3k as you build the pace or a 10k just to get you comfortable with 
oh, this is too slow. I want to go quicker, but you learn that process. But even in like, if we're doing intervals, like for us, we might do some one kilometer repeats. And even with every rep, you have to actually get it so that the first rep, it might only be hard for the last 50 meters. And then you've got enough recovery to go again. And there might be the last hundred meters and, and the last 150 and progressively as you do your reps and then you're evolving. Whereas a lot of people, they, they go for gold on the first rep and they're finished they're for done. the whole set. <laughs> so there's that. And there's other people though, that they go, they go conservatively, too conservatively. And then they spike the last one. And it's this massive rep. And it's like, well, we you really, didn't really give enough on that first We one. didn't really do the purpose of the session. You ended up just doing a run more so than anything. So yes. when we train, you have to create overload. You have to push the boundaries eventually when your body's conditioned, your mind's conditioned, your life's conditioned. If you want to get fitter, you have to create overload with intensity, volume, frequency, type of train, all the rest. So you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to push the edges a little bit and listen to your body. But just those simple sets of just starting slow and building through it is an easy way to start. And I think that's really interesting too, you know, the purpose of the session. So, you know, when I started running, it was basically just running and I did get fitter and, but then having purpose to the session. So how would you suggest to somebody that they're aerobically going to get fitter? And is that with different sessions, different type yeah. sessions? Uh, overload is the most important thing. So we've got to stress the system. So there's all these different systems in the body. But in the end, the body adapts pretty quickly, say four to six weeks, and it's pretty much got the most bang for its buck out of the sessions that you've been doing. So you've got to change it regularly. But ideally, we'd change the sessions that we're doing. The body's got all these systems, as we said, there's VO2s and thresholds and strengths and all these different sessions we can do to target specific elements of our program. So just in the end, make sure that you're changing the stimulus regularly is probably the main thing, whether that be you're going through a speed phase or a volume phase or something like that. You'd want to ideally would periodize it so that it's ready for the marathon. But for most beginners, they in the end, they just do the same stuff over and over and they expect a different result. And pretty much, yeah, within four to six weeks, the body's adapted and your three runs a week for 30, 40 minutes. It's the just, same. It's the same. You won't get better. So you either have to go put in a fifth session, a fourth or fifth session. You have to go longer with one of the sessions or you have to go a little bit faster with another session. You have to put some hills into another session in a structured way yes. and just give the body a different stimulus. Again, progressively, we do a lot of hill repeats over winter for people and it finishes up with, you know, eight lots of, a, say, three or 400 metre wrap up a hill going as hard as we can, but it takes us probably six weeks, seven, eight weeks to get to that point where we can do those sessions. So yes, change the stimulus, but sometimes you have to get your body ready for what's ahead. What's ahead. So yep. if we're going to do hard intervals, yep, we'll spend quite a bit of time getting the body ready Yes. so that it can cope with those harder intervals. But yeah, three to four weeks of really hard quality training and you pretty much get most of the gains out of those sessions um, from my experience side of things. But getting the body and mind ready for that because it, it's hard, like you push the limit. So enjoy the early stages when you're just touching the edges and have a look at what it's like to work hard and then pull back a little bit. Yeah, and be patient, isn't it? And, you know, so many people say to me, but if I go to my RPE of, you know, where I can talk, then I'm really slow. And I'm like, well, what's really slow? It's all relative, right? You could be in bed. If you need to be that slow, then that's okay, isn't it? Because really those sessions about increasing the long runs should yeah. be at that comfortable Definitely the breathing side of things. The hard part with running sometimes is that a lot of the energy for running comes from stored energy. So we hit the ground and we store energy and we spring off. Sometimes if you go slow, you don't get that stored energy. So it does become a bit of a, a shuffle and a bit of a labor. So for those people, if you're in that category, then you'd say definitely run walks are probably a better strategy and you're better off doing a five minute run, five minute walk. So the run can be a little bit quicker, body recovers, go again, and then you just increase the duration of the run or whatever mm -hmm. but for most people yeah you just have to do the run long runs nice and slow eventually over time you'll find at the same um, heart rate your speed will come down substantially yeah. but you just have to endure it and and when it happens it it clicks a good friend of ours obviously we both know Chantel and and she was complaining that she wasn't getting any fitter and I said oh, I think we're getting close to the time where it's going to click and you know at 5 30 suddenly turned into five minutes turned into 4 45 so it's just the evolution that happens with being patient but listen to your body if you've got the toys and the numbers you can use those to your advantage a little bit with the heart rate and the pace what what do you really get people to look at for me I always use heart rate is 
better um, just because it's got no emotion attached to it. If you see a number, heart rate doesn't matter. But if you see a pace, suddenly people are all excited and they think they can sustain it forever and they think they're going to be awesome. So, and next thing they know, yeah, they're on the scrap heap and all the rest. So the heart rate for me is best, but you need to need to work out roughly where your zones are. The zones that I use, are, you know, just basic years, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90% of max heart rate. I think they're close enough and yes. they, they align pretty well with most of the sort of thresholds and breakpoints and various things that are there. The easiest model though, typically for most people, if they get themselves generally fit for their running, if you run for 40 minutes, the most people run at 80% of their maximum heart rate. So from 20 minutes through to 30 minutes, you just work out what your average heart rate was, and that's probably pretty close to 80%, 80%. divided by 0.8, and that'll get your number. Yep. If you collect enough data from doing a, a few races, you'll work out what's capable with people, what they should achieve. Most people, when they train, they yeah, they just run at 80% all the time. They're just in that middle ground. Yeah, that's um, right. And, and is that too hard to just like stay at 80%? Because you know, if you're saying that they can race that for 40 minutes, you know, and you're training an hour and a half, like is that overtraining? And, and do you need to be going that quick? Yeah. 80% probably lines up pretty well with marathon intensity, to be honest. So eventually you, you will have to, to do, do a bit of training at that intensity. But to start with? To uh, start with, it's okay. But when we get into the meat and potatoes of our training, then you need to make sure you, you polarise the training is what they call. So we do some easy stuff easy and our hard stuff harder. The middle ground, it's not really going to get as much gain because it doesn't stress our systems as much as what the higher and lower training will do. Yep. And if we go too long at that 8%, it just fatigues you and you end up sore and tired and you're better off just doing your long runs easier pace. The gap between, it, it's ridiculously slow. So, yeah. It's like, you know, your pace ranges could range two minutes, basically. Yes, in, I think mine does at the moment. So it's pretty significant <laughs> between your harder stuff and your slower stuff. Yeah, there could be two minutes. Um, yes plus more than that. So yeah, even the best long distance runners in the world are all doing their slow stuff yeah. really slow. But in the end, the main thing, just make sure you enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. You use the numbers if it helps you, but you have to sort of allow 20 minutes before the heart rate creeps up and plateaus out. And that's why we normally start to feel better after 20 minutes. We've stopped using those anaerobic pathways. But often your speed for the first few Ks, I've done runs before and I go, wow, I'm on fire here today. And your speed's there and you get trapped into thinking, oh, I just want to sustain that speed and I'm, I'm on fire. But you just lock in your heart rate, you forget about it and before you know it, you look at your data after and you go, well, that turned into a really good run. Yes. Um, but if you get sucked into racing to pace or training to pace all the time, you get in trouble. Unless we're doing intervals and hard stuff, then, yes. then it is about our paces and our our targets for a 200 or a 400 or 800 or a three minutes or two minutes or whatever we're doing, then you'll have some numbers to chase. And what about, you know, people say often the first two or three Ks is really difficult. Is that because that heart rate sort of, you're just stabilising everything? And yeah. obviously you get to that point where the data is more significant when it gets to three, four, five Ks in those first... You definitely want to have a warm up before most things. In the end, you get blood flowing through the body. We've been sedentary most of the day for all of us. So yeah. blood's a, a painkiller, I guess, or movement's a bit of a painkiller. So yeah, we get some endorphins true. released and all that sort of stuff. So once that happens, then we're better placed. And also, if you're going at a certain pace, the aerobic contribution takes a while before it becomes 100%. So there's a little bit of anaerobic there to start with as well as it gets going. So yeah, it's just a matter of being patient early on, do your warm ups, build into it, don't get going. And I'm finding out. as I get older, I need that warm up more. You know, when I was younger, I didn't need it as much. But as I'm getting older, I'm I'm requiring a bit more of a warm up. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I've got to get that blood moving. I think we're just so sedentary in our day to day <laughs> yes. existence, so that it's yes. hard. Definitely, as you're older, we've all got kids, and kids are. Yes. You see them how flat out they go from the get go, and they can bounce back the next day without too many dramas. But yeah, I think those days might be uh, behind <laughs> us a little bit, but warm-ups are important. Yes, and the other thing I wanted to ask you, because I know time's limited, but there's so much to ask you, Nigel, and so much information that you're giving us all, so thank you, um, is about breathing. So many people come into running going, oh, my God, I'm so scared about my breathing. Am I going to stop breathing? It, breathing is a natural thing. We don't even think about it when we're walking. But when, when you start running, it is scary when you get to that point of, <gasps> you know, I, am I going to have a heart attack? What What's your advice on that? Breathing isn't just another correlation with that RPE and how intense we're working. It's whether breathing's related to anxiety. I wouldn't expect many beginners to get to the point where they're breathing pretty heavy, where it's short of breath and all that sort of stuff. So as it is, just pull back a little bit is, is the best advice you can give. I would 
like to think that they're not getting to the point where they're bent over, collapsing, gasping for breath. So I think um, it's more that they get scared because they haven't had that. You know, they haven't had that feeling. So they're out there running for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth time, and it's yep. kind of like, what do I do? You know, I'm, I'm out of breath, and and I do suggest that they slow down and get to that comfortable point. Yeah, it's get the warm up. Firstly, probably make sure you've warmed up, do a walk, whatever it's going to be, gradually build the pace, get your exposed. And then in that early phase of training, though, you should always be, you're not, I always say, touch the edges. So you go up, have a look. Oh, yeah, I'm breathing heavy. As soon as I start to feel as if it's fast, I'll slow back down again. So do go a long run. This feels great. It's the first sign of anything going, oh, this is hard. Just stop. Just go for a walk. Eventually, your body and brain will get conditioned to that level of intensity and you'll be in a better place to recognise it as just a normal part of the the running cycle. If it's a part of anxiety, though, then obviously it might take a little bit more. But if you do your first park run, like that's going to... You're going to blow a little bit on that one. So most beginners are going to be conservative on their first park runs anyway. But normally your breathing is not a limiter for you as far as performance is concerned. So... Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, I'd be curious to see how how those people would go if they just did a warm up or if they just built Slow into down. it, um, or whether it's anxiety related or or yeah, if they're just chasing other people probably more than anything. Yeah, typically breathing rate is related a little to that anaerobic thresholds and all the rest. So aerobic threshold is roughly that sort of seventy five percent max heart rate. And that's where you first start to notice my breathing something, and you're going, yeah, I'm actually breathing here. If I stop, I'd go. Yeah, I'm, I'm still breathing a little bit. It takes me a little bit of time to catch my breath out. Earlier than that, uh, it's probably not much at all at, as far as breathing is concerned. Once you're into marathon pace, it just feels like, yeah, normal breathing. I'm working. I can still talk to someone, but I know I'm working side of things. Once you get to 85 to 90, 85% is where the longer you go at it, it gets harder and harder. That's pretty close to half marathon pace. And yeah, I've had some half marathon races where we have a group of us going out and everyone's talking and jovial. And then all of a sudden, and then it just silence. It's, uh, what's happened, everyone? Where are they going here? And you can't trash talk anymore or yes. whatever. So it does evolve that way during a run as well. That's not quite um, clear cut of this pace will get you that breathing rate and whatever. So yes. breathing rate's important, but it will evolve through it. But it's all about just tuning into your body and knowing how it responds to different paces and what it should feel like at the different heart rates or different paces or different perceptions of effort. Yeah, so it's all about the practice. The other question I had for you is all about Strava. You and I as coaches have had um, many years of coaching people and having to prove ourselves over time and you know, and then we've had to deal with injuries and I know you have had plenty like I have and, and we have to start back just like everyone else. And, you know, I'm, I'm on Strava and I've just had to forget my ego and think, you know, like at the moment, you know, I'm letting my body recover. But I see so many people out there running for Strava, right? They want to do the four and a half minute Ks every week or they want to do the four minute because James does that and someone else does that. So I've got to do that. What do you think about Strava? It serves a purpose. I don't use it or I'm not really on it at all. I'm a bit old school on that side of things. It serves a purpose for a certain personality type, people who, you know, very extroverted, social, that sort of stuff. People though, they get caught up chasing this or chasing that and they're doing this and they're doing that so in the end it comes down to being clear on what you're after is what's what's going to work for me what's my plan i'm following and just stick to that and and it's just monitoring your own progress is really it strava yeah i guess it has some some elements that may be positive but I would avoid it for, for most people. Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, like the, the whole thing, even Garmin or whatever it is, you just have to take your ego out of it, don't you? Like it, like for me, when I'm recovering or I'm coming back for injury, I just have to be okay with being okay about recovering and not having yeah. to... And you only get that through experience. So yes. You don't get that through your first up. You only get it in time that, yeah, I could run a 2.30 marathon, but now I'd be lucky to run, uh, yeah, well, you've be got a much broken slower <laughs> and I'll be running slower because yes. I'm running with slower people. But in the end, I enjoy... My, the reason why I do it is I, I enjoy running with people and I enjoy com- competing, I'll enjoy improving. So whether... A, when you start a new page, it's, it's a new page. You, every day you like get a chance to improve every time. And and whether I'm running at the pointy end of the field or the middle or the back, it doesn't matter because I'm still racing with people and you still have the same contest and you're still challenging yourself and trying to improve. And it's not even, sometimes you're racing people, but often it's, I'm trying to execute the session perfectly. So I'm still standing at the end while they all blow up. And yes. I get a great deal of satisfaction from just pulling that off. So yeah, whether you're... You just have to accept your 
position in in time and what you're capable of doing and what your goals are for that time isn't it and they can yeah. change and, and you will adjust your programs and things will yeah. evolve they or, definitely do. or they go backwards or you know you just have to always look at yourself and not worry about everyone else we are in the jones as well we've got to keep up with them unfortunately whether it be uh, the house or the kids or the dog or the school or the the running it's yeah. still the same everyone wants everyone's competitive but in the end and that's where it came back to that first thing you said it comes back to why did I do this in the first place? Yes. Is it for social appeal, social recognition? Is it for Strava, kudos? Is it for um, how many badges you can get? If it is, well, that's great. But most people didn't start the journey for that for particular that. reason. So that's where we'd always go back to the start and say, why did you do this in the first place? And there's so many athletes that I've coached over the years that gradually just turned themselves off all their social connections because it, it defeated the purpose about why they were doing the sport in the first place. They didn't want to do it for comparing themselves or getting kudos from anyone else. They just did it because they wanted to do it for their own personal reasons. So if, if you can always come back to that. And your enjoyment. Yeah, yeah. It's the enjoyment, isn't it? Because if you're not enjoying something, there's no reason in doing it. So it has to be enjoyment. Uh, definitely. Uh, but having said that, there's people who are super competitive. And yes. Strava is brilliant for them. Yes. And it's our role as coaches just to keep them in check and make sure that they don't get too ahead of themselves. And it's fine for them to grasp new concepts and new ideas or and bring, but maybe things bring them to you as coaches and just say oh they're doing this how will this work and then you can guide them and say oh maybe we could build it in in this phase of the training or whatever let loose without any guidance people will just chase this chase that chase that and next thing you know they're they're on the scrap heap and uh <laughs> It's well, it's happened to me. You've got so much information. I could sit here for about four hours with you. If the last thing I'm going to leave with you with it and ask you for, I've got two weeks before my first half marathon. What advice do you give me? Two weeks. It's a, probably the main thing. If it's your first ever one, anxiety, controlling anxiety, we want to make it a fun experience. So if there's any fears you've had, you have, that's really what you need to be addressing. So there's a little um, psychological tool, I guess. It's um, if then and what now. So, and your fears are the ifs. So if this happens, what will I do on the day? So we're starting to address those, we're prepared for it. And then what can I do now to limit that if from happening in the first place? So for me, that's the most important mm. part of it is getting our, our mind um, comfortable and at ease and then it's about your race day plan. So how am I going to pace it? And it could just be the simple breaking it up into quarters and knowing that it could be something about heart rate or paces or whatever. Just have a plan. It doesn't even matter if the plan's right or wrong. Just have a plan. It could be you're going to run, walk it. Well, I don't really care if it's just a right or wrong one. Yeah. Just have a plan Yeah. because that's about managing that expectations versus reality. So have your plan. Test it out. If it's two weeks before, you'd probably do some sort of race pace hit out two weeks before and do a, if it's before a half marathon, you might run 10 or 12 Ks at half marathon pace a couple of weeks prior. Just get a feel for it. How's it feel? If you can't get to 10 or 12 Ks and it feels easy, it's too hard. Yeah. So you need to then pull, pull back, back your plan for the day. But yeah, if then, what can you do now? Have your break plan, a little bit of testing, and then just have faith in what you've done and get excited. Yeah, and the week before, do you suggest running a half marathon the week before or do you suggest? I uh, know, we probably, <laughs> depends on the person, yeah. where they're at and how they're evolving, but typically you wouldn't need to do that side of things. A lot of people have that fear about, oh, I've got to go the distance and I've got to, they fear the distance, but you, you don't really need to. If we've got the pacing strategy set up, if you've done a 14, 15, 16K run, you'll be fine for a, a 21K, providing you get the the pacing strategy in line uh, with what you want to do. Yeah. But for some people, it might work to do a 21K controlled the week before. Depends how much running mileage well, they've got in Ideally two them. weeks before or something. Yeah, it depends. Like some people, if they haven't had a big build up or they've got 10 years of running experience, we might run a 21K yep. the week before. It probably mightn't be an issue for them. Um, for me, I do next to nothing. I drive, drive it way down for myself. That works for me. Yep. A few little freshening up things if it's an important race. As long as I feel good, every session at the end is just about making sure. Turning those legs over, isn't it? Uh, you just want to, I just want to feel as if I'm feel ready, good ready and I feel go. ready and I feel excited, but I never want to leave all my best work on the park. I just want to make sure that I've go into that race day going, yep, I feel ready. Sometimes though, if it's a big race and I've tapered, I may feel quite lethargic and tired in that final week, yes. which again, I just learned, oh, well, that's just a part of the process and come race day, I have faith that 
it'll all come together and I'll be awesome. Yeah, hopefully. and I guess I guess one of the things that you always taught me and I always hear Nigel in my head is, you know, make sure I'm rested, you know, the week before, just turn 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 my legs over, do the 10Ks or 20, depending on the race, have a nice run, enjoy it, but get to the starting line where I'm ready to go. So I'm ready yep. to, you know, ready to give everything. So I've got I've got all the energy back in me. Like I'm I'm really actually biting to have a long run again, yep. you know. And that's right. And but you'll work with your clients and athletes and they'll work out what's best for them. Some need to train all the time. Some need to do very little. So it's just a matter of working out what's the best for their model head. for them. Yeah. yeah, It's all about the head. Mind. Yeah, it definitely is. So if we just want it to be the best experience they can have, um, it's unlikely. Uh, the tapering is definitely, you know, scientifically proven to be the best model. But if people taper and mentally they're shot because they've got too much time on their hands and they're annoying their kids and their husband and all <laughs> Get the Get out, go for a run. That's right. <laughs> so they're probably better off doing some training when it's like that. And in, in terms of that, in terms of hydration and fuel, in the last few days before, um, what would you say? Again, it's person specific yep. what times they're looking for and all the rest. But for most people, you do want a little bit. It's carbohydrate. It's a is our main fuel that we'll need for that event. So you typically have a little bit more uh, carbohydrate on the Saturday. For me, you don't eat different foods, just eat foods that you normally would eat. There's various models that are around, but what works for me is basically I just eat the normal foods that I normally eat, just make sure they're all carb-based meals for breakfast, lunch, and in, in for dinner, and then make sure I'm drinking, I don't just drink water, but I'll drink carbohydrate, love sports drink or yeah, Gatorade juice or, and stuff. Yeah, yep. all of that sort of stuff, soft yep. drink or whatever. Um, it's just an easy way to get your calories in, have your breakfast. And generally you say do that two or three days before like the Gatorade and stuff. Is that uh, right it's probably carbs? 36 hours is probably yep. enough on a Friday okay. night. But that's if you're really gunning for a big race. A half marathon, it's unlikely you're going to really need 100% fuel stores for those, mm -hmm. for a marathon definitely. So you don't need to go all in. You just need to make sure that we're topped up a reasonable level on that Saturday is probably enough. Um, for, for running on the hour, Sunday. For, for a run on the Sunday, yeah. Yeah. Have your breakfast that you're comfortable with a couple of hours before, at yeah. least two hours. You don't want to be three or four because then you'll probably be hungry again before um, race starts. So it's just working out, again, what's going to be best for you. But definitely need to have some carbohydrate in you during it's unlikely you'll need to take on too much during a half if they've got sports drinks on the course you can access those to get something in some people like gels so they might have a gel during a run or some lollies or whatever is going to work a bit of sugar going in during the race for a half it's always a good thing yes um, but it doesn't have to be like the marathon um, and it can be a mental thing too can't it like for you know sometimes you think i do feel better but i don't know if i feel better because i've yeah, well, there's been, again, the science is, you know, even things like just taking a sports drink, swishing your mouth and spitting it out will improve your performance time over just drinking water um, just because the brain's got a message that there's sugar on its the way. Sugar. So it'll keep you going for, for longer. So just trickling some sugar in through the day is, is worthwhile. It's unlikely you're going to, you know, bonk totally, yes. but it's always just sending that message to the brain that, yep, always sugar around and we're not, we don't have any fears about, you know, running out basically. So. Yeah. And another good thing that you've always taught me is about clothing. And, you know, like I remember going to a New York run and you said to me, if it's under four degrees, then you might consider not wearing your shorts. Um, but if it's minus four degrees or over, just wear shorts. And I see so many of my newcomers coming to my program and running with me because they are, ashamed of their bodies really so they wear these tight you know big black things and jumpers and I'm like oh my god you just got to take that off um, and lose that anxiety but definitely you know in racing tell me yeah. what your, your belief about that all is again it's horses for courses a little yes. bit everyone's going to be different, Course, and, different and like the faster you run the more heat you produce the bigger you are the more heat you reproduce smaller people will lose heat a lot quicker than a bigger person so you match it up for that uh, basically got like Barossa marathons coming up in May? 10 weeks or yeah. so. Um, so in May, Barossa has the potential to be like minus, like it could be minus two or three at the start line. So for me, when it's really cold, I always wear gloves. Yeah. Um, so nice cotton gloves. I always wear a hat. I might start with an old shirt yes, um, that I can like discard. This, put around um, the waist. That I can get rid of as I'm going, but the hats and the top are the most and uh, hats and gloves are the most important thing. If it gets to ten degrees, that's because you lose your heat out of here, don't you? The you, extremities, and because they're moving around through the wind, you'll the, you'll feel the coolness a little bit more, um, and the hat will you know there's a lot of blood supply to the the head, so it'll um, hold a little bit of that in hopefully. But if it's 
if it's a mild day, you know, I can get by with, you know, just shorts and a tank top is fine for, yes. for most of your running that you do. And I find, you know, like you said, you know, bringing something old, particularly for New York or Barossa, you know, old jumper and just discard it, you know, like and yep. run with it for a little while and show them your bib as you go across the start line and, and yep. throw it off. If you can do that, that's that just makes sense because your body will soon heat up. It yep. doesn't take long to get too warm, even on the, it's only when it's raining. If it's raining, then we're all drowned rats out there and it's, it's not ideal. But, but then you've got to deal with that too. Yeah. I remember the Adelaide Marathon, I left my jumper on the bridge and I came back and there it was and put it on and went home. Went, That's fantastic, <laughs> only in Adelaide. <laughs> big, just your water over there. <laughs> um, but that's fantastic. Thank you for coming in today. Is there anything else you'd think that uh, we haven't covered that we should? It's endless, basically, what we could be talking about. But it's really just have faith in yourself as a person, have faith and know why you want to do it in the first place and uh, just enjoy the process, enjoy the journey, forget about what everyone else is doing, know why you're doing it in the first place is probably the most important thing and you'll learn. Just consider it a journey and, yeah, as I said, don't forget to look back every now and then and just see how far you've come and, yeah, enjoy the ride, basically. Yeah. So thank you very much. Nigel is um, does contribute to the online programs with me, so thank you for your involvement in that. Nigel also um, has uh, Nigel Peach Coaching, which offers one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is very different to the online courses that we offer. So if anyone wants to get in contact with you, that's Nigel Peach Coaching. Is that the best way to look it up? Yep, they'll find me on there. Yep, otherwise you can get in contact with me. But thank you for your time today. Thank you for all your um, knowledge that you've imparted on me too over all these years. I really uh, value your support and coaching to me. Thank you, Nigel. Too easy. No worries. All Enjoy. Right. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you want more, go to analiptac.com. <laughs>